Good evening. I'm Deborah Merrill Sands, and I'm the Dean of the Peter T. Paul College of Business and Economics. Deborah Merrill Sands is my name. Um, and I have the privilege tonight of introducing our host and guest speaker for this evening. And this is a particular privilege because Alyssa Steele, who is our host and speaker, is an alum of what we called WISB, Whittemore School of Business and Economics, until 2013, and then we converted to the name of Paul College. So it's a real pleasure for me to be here tonight and be present for this talk. Um, Alyssa has over 25 years of experience in leadership in the tech industry. As you all know, she is currently the CEO of Namely, and Namely is the leading HR platform for mid-sized companies. Prior to coming to Namely, she was the president and CEO of Jive, and Jive was an interesting company providing um, social networking software for businesses. Before that, she had a series of leadership roles, Vice President and Chief Marketing Officer of Consumer Apps and Services at Microsoft, Chief Marketing Officer at Skype, Executive Vice President and Chief Marketing Officer at Yahoo, Senior Vice President of Marketing at NetApp, and as she's held leadership roles in Sun Microsystems and AT&T as well. So as you can see, we have a very experienced speaker in the field of technology tonight. She's also active and has been active on many boards. Currently, in addition to Namely, she serves as the chair of the board of Cornerstone On Demand, and she is also a member of the board of uh, directors of Splunk. So just from that very brief introduction, I think you can see that Elisa's had an absolutely fascinating career. She's moved a lot. She's taken lots of leadership positions. I'm sure she's taken risks. She's experimented. So I think we'll have a wonderful evening hearing about her journey and her insights onto leadership and, and how she's developed her career. So with that, I'd like to ask you to join you, join me in welcoming Elisa to the floor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. This is so great to have you here at Navy. So welcome to all. Um, and I have a rule. I've been doing talks like this. Well, we all do, right, in our jobs. And I never, ever drink before a talk. However, UNH is where I learned this skill. <laughs> so I decided tonight it was OK to bring my wine up here. I'm very at home. I'm feeling good. And I remembered. What's that? Small yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, but it truly is a place where I learned how to, how to party. Um, but it was also an amazing lifelong learning um, experience for me. And I'm really excited to share my story with you, which I'll make, I hope, relatively short in terms of the slides because we're here to really talk and have a dialogue tonight and happy to take any questions or thoughts or hear your stories as well. Um, the Wildcats are here behind me, and um, that brings back a memory, too, of all of the school spirit at UNH and the way that we come together to kind of root for our home team. And I have to tell you, well, many of you may, may know, but I actually live in California. And I went on a program at UNH when I was a sophomore that was called an exchange program with San Diego State. And it was crazy to me at the time because I had never been or never um, really spent any time in California, but UNH offered this amazing program and it seemed like this foreign land where me and my roommates could go spend a semester. And so we did that. And they don't call you wildcats. It's San Diego, we got off the plane and I don't know what happened, they just called us hamsters. <laughs> and so for a semester I wasn't a wildcat, I was a hamster and uh, well known at San Diego State. Anyways, welcome, welcome. And this picture of opening slide is you know, UNH for me was a really special time, and one of the reasons that UNH came into my life was because of family, and I'm gonna give you a little bit of an insight into that and how I wound up there. But this is my family, extended family, and everybody else in between, and you know, that's what really matters in life, is, is your family and your friends and how you de develop those relationships along the course of your journey. And as I was sitting listening to the dean introduce me, I was feeling, rather mature <laughs> about my age. And I realized that, you know, my daughter is um, actually a freshman in college now. And when I think about my years at UNH and think about being a freshman, it just seems like yesterday. Um, and it seems so close to the heart. So let's, let's sort of dive right in here. Mm -hmm. 
when I was, this looks like something I'm sharing that you think I'm going to tell you my whole life story from when I was six years old, but that's not it. My first executive coach, I was the CMO at Yahoo, and I had an executive coach to kind of work on my development and where we were going to go in terms of strategy. And when she first started working with me, I was like, I do not have time for you. I have a job I need to do, and I don't have time to sit around and talk to you about the things you want to ask me about. So finally, she was so frustrated with me, and my boss was like, you will have an executive coach, and you will talk to her. Um, she was so frustrated with me that she gave me a, um, a pad of paper and some um, coloring pencils, and I was on my way to Asia on a business trip, and she gave it to me right before I got on the plane, and she said, I know you won't talk to me, but you, will you draw something for me? And so I got on the plane to Asia, and a couple of glasses of wine in, I drew this. And this is my life story, starting with my family on the very left-hand side and going through, at that time, what I called my life map and all of my experiences up until Yahoo, where you see all of those different heads and crazy arms and legs and trying to figure things out of what we were going to do. And of course, after Yahoo, I was going to be in the clouds with stars and hearts and, and money, and I didn't know what was next in my life then. But tonight, I'm going to focus right here. And that's me in the library tutoring other students because that was how my parents would pay for me to go to college, but they would not pay for me to go to parties. <laughs> and therefore, I had to get a job. And so I got a job tutoring and earning, I don't remember the organization that I, I did it through, and I would go to the lives and uh, tutor kids in different subjects, um, actually math and, and Spanish. And that's my little UNH symbol there on the right. I drew this in 2010. Um, and my roommates were a really big part of my life, which their names are kind of off to the side on the clouds. The reason I got introduced to UNH was um, an older cousin had gone there. And he was actually a senior when I was a high, junior, uh, senior in high school. And I didn't know where the heck I wanted to go to college or what I would do. And Lou said, come up and visit me and come see UNH. You might enjoy the school. So I did. I, came, I went up uh, to visit him and he was taking me for a tour on the campus. And he said, look, um, I don't know a lot of the gals to let you into the dorms, but I do know this one room. And I know the girls who live, it's a triple, and I know the girls who live in there. So if you want to see a room, why don't we go on up and we'll knock on the door and see if they're there. And so we did, and we went up to Divine Hall. Recognizable, right? Um, uh, fourth floor. And he took me up, he knocked on the door of the room was 417L because it was on a corner and it was a triple. He knocked on the door and the girls were home. They opened the door, we got introduced and I saw this, what I thought was an amazing college dorm room. Um, and I sat there and I chatted with the gals and walked away and felt like, wow, that would be a really, really cool place to live. Fast forward, I actually loved UNH so much I applied early decision I didn't want to apply anywhere else and thank you for letting me in because I didn't have to do any other college applications <laughs> and I did get in and I did say yes and I showed up the first day and this is my roommate in Divine Hall guess what room I was assigned to 417 L I couldn't believe it I got to campus I got my room assignment I go up to four and I know for some of the younger people in the room you know your roommates before you even get there my daughter was on social media and sharing pictures and doing face, FaceTime with her roommates before she ever got to her school. We had no idea. You just sort of got your assignment and you walked up to a door and you knocked on it and you didn't know who was gonna be on the other side of that door. It was the very same girls that Lou introduced me to that former year before I had applied. And we are best friends today. We spend time together, we're totally involved in each other's lives. We live in different states and have different lives, but we're completely involved. And um, that's my best friend there, um, hanging out of Divine Hall, right over where Carl's used to park. Now, please tell me there's people who have eaten Carl's in this audience. Okay, <laughs> excellent, excellent. Sorry guys, but all the older people, yes. Um, Carl's was fantastic and it used to just kind of go right up to our window so you can tell I definitely got addicted to the freshman 20 or whatever it was. 
Um, and Thompson Hall, um, I'm sure you still have blizzards. Um, not that I'm a part of it. And Tin Palace Pizza was my absolute favorite. Um, even though I sat here and talked about Carl's, it was Tin Palace Pizza that we got on when we could afford it because it was actually expensive. It was probably $10 a pizza. So very, very hard to raise money for that. What have I really learned along the way with all that nostalgia kind of to kick us off? And there's really three things for me, and they're pretty simple. One is about being passionate and finding what you really love to do. What do you really love to do? And do that. Because there's plenty of stuff that you could be spending your time on, and you don't want to be spending time on stuff that you don't love. That doesn't mean it's not hard. Super hard. If you actually spend time on the stuff you love, you find that the hard things challenge you and motivate you because you want to get it done so badly. So I think bringing that passion to work is critical. The other thing I would tell you, and I think that this is a lifelong quest, whether you're a CEO or um, uh, any any job in the workplace, it's curiosity. You can't solve problems if you don't ask questions and if you don't care how other people think about it or can share their experiences. So bring that curiosity everywhere you go and that is gonna help you be a better leader and be a better problem solver. So much better to get things done in groups. You can't do things really great alone. And then the third is, um, you know, I've had a lot of experience on the enterprise side of business. Big enterprises that have really complex uh, technology solutions and also big scale consumer companies who are really driving, you know, massive reach into the consumer world. And what I found that is similar with both of those and everything in between is that if you can create an interaction that is an intimate relationship that makes people feel like you really care, you're going to get the business. It doesn't matter if it's enterprise or consumer. It doesn't matter if it's tech technology or any or business or teaching or education or whatever. People want to be in a great environment where they feel like they were delighted by that interaction. And I think that if you can create customer experiences that really wow people, then you can deliver all those other things. And really, you're given a lot of permission because you make mistakes along the way. Everything in business isn't perfect. Your product isn't perfect. Your service isn't perfect. Nothing's perfect. But if you have a relationship that you trust and that there are people in that company that you know care, then you're going to come back again and again. And it's a little bit of an old school kind of thinking, right? SaaS companies are built on repeatable business models that absolutely automate your renewal but they're actually not gonna work over the long term if that customer doesn't feel like they can trust you and that they have a relationship with you. So I would just sum it up with passion, curiosity, and wow experiences. You're gonna have a grade A team. You're gonna attract grade A talent. I get asked a lot, like, what was you, how did you plan your career? Well, I didn't. Um, just kind of figure things out along the way. And this, kind of old adage of what's your career ladder, what's the career ladder that I have at this company or that company, I don't think works. When you think about being on a ladder, what's the first thing that people say when you start to climb a ladder? Be careful, <laughs> don't fall, <laughs> it's rickety. It's not a real strong foundation. So what is a career ladder? It's kind of rickety and it's not a strong foundation. And who are you with at the top of a ladder? Absolutely no one you're all alone and you can't get great things done alone. It's all about the team, it's all about collaboration. So my concept is around build a pyramid. You wanna think about your career, you wanna think about really your life and what is the foundation, which I believe most of the foundation is around relationships. Technology plays a really big role today, but ultimately if you ask me now, who are the relationships in your, even your working world? if you look back and how you got to wherever you wanna be, I can cite relationships 10, 15 years ago that actually enabled me to be right here, right now. One of them just left the building who is our newest investor who I've known for 15 years and I never knew he would be an investor of a company that I was CEO of. I never even knew I was gonna be a part of this company. So those relationships and that, what people call networking is just too shallow. Those relationships that you build along the way 
create opportunity for you, and then you are able to create opportunity for others, which for me at this point in my life is probably the biggest fulfillment that I have in my day. I'll tell you a little bit about my pyramid, which is up here on the slide. I had a lot of different assignments, and one of the things that I would coach young people to do is to take those different assignments. Don't go straight up a function. I love marketing, but I'm a better marketer if I was in a sales role and I had a quota. I'm a better marketer if I understand the operations challenges that the team has in delivering service to customers. I'm a better marketer if I know how to build a product really well, because then I can partner with all of those people across the company and understand how to be a good partner and to help everyone around me be better. So all of those roles might have focused one place or the other, but had a lot of different exposure to different opportunities. One of the um, folks I was meeting at Namely today was telling me about, and who's early in their career, was telling me or, or asking me about how to get those different experiences. And I was remembering back my very first job at AT&T, um, the way to get the job was we, got a, we had to, all of the candidates had to go to the lobby of the embassy suites in Burlingame and we all got a case study. And in two hours, we had to then present to the virtual executive team of that company to sell them the technology solution. So you all had two hours frantically, you know, your competitors are there, right? Because the other people vying for the job are there, reading the case study, preparing your presentation. You got your, hotel, you got your room number where the mock CFO, CEO, CIO, whatever the round table was, would, you would go into the room and they were your customer for the next hour. And you were to sell them on the technology solution. And that was just such an awesome way to take all of the education, all of the experiences and say, how do I pack that in to an interaction in one hour that has you think that I'm the best person for the job? And that was just such an awesome experience. And then AT&T kind of gave me an amazing foundation of learning and development for the next seven years. And I did all sorts of roles with all of those brands up there. And I do see namely at the top of my pyramid. And some of it I already alluded to, which is I can kind of, one really cool part, one really cool idea that I would like to do for this slide, but I don't think we'll ever do, Mary, is I could probably take each of these brands, <laughs> click a few levels below on key people, and connect them to all these other brands on the chart. Because they were enablers, promoters, supporters, advocates of what I was trying to do. And many of them, some in this audience today, who worked with me and on my team in the first layer of my pyramid, how many years ago that was. And they're in the room today working with me at Namely. So I just can't emphasize enough those relationships and connections of how you develop um, you know, value added um, partnership is just so important. So I'm going to give you a couple rules, and there's five, so if you're thinking, when is she done, I'm done at five, <laughs> and then we're going to do Q&A. So rule number one, embrace change. This sounds so simple, doesn't it? But it's not simple for human beings. Even the people like me who say, you have to embrace change, and you have to do it really quickly, and you should love change. We hate change. I hate when someone comes to me and says, I'm going to move this from here to there, and it's going to be better, and let me tell you why, especially if it wasn't my idea. So embracing change is really, really hard. And this slide is, yes, some get it right, and you kind of know where the future is going, and that's a lot to do with business because you're making a bet. Again, whether you're the CEO or whether you're the receptionist or whether you're the customer service manager, you're making a bet on what your customers need and where you're going, and then you're putting all your resources against that bet. And some people don't get it right. And when you don't get it right, it's not that fun. <laughs> It's just not that fun, although it is the thing you learn the most of, from, isn't it? The things that, that don't work out. So the point of this rule number one in embracing change is we're in a world where technology changes wicked fast. And I, didn't, I haven't used that word in a long time. It's, you're all rubbing off on me. It's like wicked fast that, um, you don't say that in California, um, that change happens and that technology happens. And there's actually... Um, a study on this where, remember in year 2000, right, when, well, some of us remember in year 2000, there was this major technology change, and it took 
years to prepare for this major technology change for the year 2000. And now that same amount of change happens in an hour in terms of technology advancement. So if you believe that, and maybe you don't believe it's an hour, maybe you believe it's a day, maybe you believe it's a week, it doesn't really matter. The point is, is that it's a completely different paradigm and that human beings don't move at the pace of technology change. So if you're involved in a team, if you're involved in a company, whether it's a commercial company or you're on a board of something or you're you know, volunteering your time, it's all the same, which is human beings don't move at the pace of change of technology. And so you have to be very purposeful on what change you wanna bring forward. So embrace change, but think purposely about how you're gonna bring it to others. And I would end this one rule with, sometimes you have to go slow to go fast. Really think through how you wanna drive that change. And I don't think any career, any aspiration can really be accomplished without understanding change. The second rule, know your work style. So at least when I started my career, by the way, I grew up in a really traditional household. So my dad had the job, my mom was a stay-at-home mom, I had two siblings, and we had a pretty like boring TV show family life. It just kind of went as you would predict that it would go, and we didn't have a lot of drama until my parents moved to California. That's another story. Um, but when I entered the workforce at 21, 22 years old, I really kind of grew up with I'm thinking that you're, you go to work and you have your work persona and like you're really serious at work and you're driving you know, to the goal. And for me at least, financial independence at that time was the only thing I cared about. I had no career aspirations. I just wanted to get an apartment that I could pay for because I wanted to have a life that didn't depend on someone else. I wanted to have a life that I had choices in and so when I say financial independence was important, like my daughter said to me once when she was really young, mom, is that all you care about is money? It's like, you know what? It's not shallow. What I care about is that I have choices for me. I have choices for my children and that I can make those choices with freedom. So financial independence was the first thing. And I went to work with a really serious face on because I was just there to try to figure out how I was going to be successful. And then when I went home, especially in my 20s, I was my UNH self with my roommates. And those two things didn't interact. But the reality of life today is that work style and lifestyle are one and the same. I love coming to work at Namely, I can just be myself. And sure, it's really serious being a CEO and you gotta get shit done. But you're also gonna do it with your personality and your connections and your people skills. And it's more to life than just your work persona. That's never happened since I've been at Namely, and I hope it's not a real fire alarm. So one of our senior um, VPs just left the room to go make sure that we're okay, because that's actually serious. Okay. Okay. Excellent. So those of you on the webcast, we're having a real time. Um, <laughs> did I talk about crisis management and how important <laughs> it is to be calm during a crisis? And I want to thank Mary and Kevin, who both immediately walked out of the room to make sure that our guests and ourselves are okay. Shall we go on to rule number three? <laughs> rule number three. Um, this slide didn't quite come out in terms of the, the creative, but this is the whole concept of having OKRs. And for those of you working in um, you know, different companies, if you don't have OKRs rolling out, I would, I would give you the thesis that you're not optimizing your potential. OKRs are about objectives and key results that you really figure out in your company that are cross-functional. Because if you look at these words, whether it's growth or profitability, engagement, customer experiences, or employees, who's in charge of all that? No one. Like there's no department that is in charge of engagement with your partners, your customers. There's no department that's in charge of growth. Not really. Sales isn't the only department in charge of growth, right? Product has to enable it. Service has to enable it. And so if, the, if you believe some version of these five things are important in terms of how you build a successful company, 
then you need to have a cross-functional process which allows you to, to discover and then commit to what the, what the business objectives really are. Because what's really hard is working cross-functionally. And it's kind of back to the latter. You can just keep on going in one function and you'll ultimately kind of peter out. But if you actually figure out along the way how you do it together, you get to a greater place. So these five things are what I think about every day as a CEO. Are we growing healthily? Are, do we have a, either a path to profitability or that we are profitable because we either have investors who sh or shareholders who we're committed to? Do we have an engaged in ecosystem? Customers, partners, investors, are they all in it together? And are you creating experiences that drives engagement up all the time in your product too? Customer experiences, I gave you my, my view on that. And then employees, you absolutely get nothing done if your organization has wonderful strategy, great product, fantastic goals, but you don't have the talent and the employees to go get it done. So at the end of the day, really, it's all about a people strategy or nothing can happen. So rule number three, set clear measurable objectives. Rule number four, balance your head and your heart. So there's a little bit of science, of course, to making decisions data available like it's never been available before. I mean, namely itself, we have 1,300 customers. We process payroll for over 200,000 people in different companies across the country. We know a lot of data about what's happening in the workplace. We know a lot of insights around how the workplace is being managed, who's getting recognized, who's not getting recognized, who's getting promoted, who's not getting promoted, what the mean salaries are for current job titles, all sorts of good data but that's not good enough alone, right? You also have to have your heart in it. What is it that you're ultimately trying to accomplish? Although every day at Namely, we wake up and we have very clear business objectives of what we're trying to do. We also ultimately have a vision for our company and it happens this company, our vision is to build better workplaces. And we have great software, but you can't build better workplaces unless you have a whole combo of a strategy that has to do with software and people and ecosystem and environment and physical and remote and virtual and all of those things. And so the combination, I think, of your head and your heart, and I will tell you early in my career, I think I used or tried to use data. It wasn't as available, but tried to use science and data in making decisions, so much so that I left my gut aside. And I can think of the times I left my gut aside and they're 100% regrettable. 100% regrettable. You combine that with your instinct and sometimes your instinct, even without the data, is something you really need to listen to. So I think it's really important, as a matter of fact, if you're kind of interested in my view on this, um, there's an article uh, in, in the New York Times around trusting your instincts that uh, Adam, um, Adam Bryant interviewed me for a couple years ago. Rule number five, and I think this is probably, for me, um, the most personal, which is I've learned over these years that it is about your head and your heart. It is about your work style and your lifestyle. It is about your whole self. And telling stories around any of your experiences and listening to other stories to learn is probably the most important thing to create the right relationships. And storytelling has been elevated in the last couple of years as an important business concept, particularly in the go-to-market side of the house so that you can really get those connections with your customers. And I think I really had an aha on this when I was at the point in my career was I was at, I was at Skype. And Skype was a really hard business model because it was all about the human connection, but you couldn't make any money unless you sold advertising. And like, how do those two things go together? human connection of an amazing video call with my family or my friends on the other side of the world, on the other side of the country, on the other side of the state. And then I'm going to show up on the left-hand rail with a bunch of advertising for a new cell phone. Like, how does that work? And so what we decided to do as a strategy is to really figure out how to create that human connection that's authentic and not a marketing ploy or a slick, glossy cover but what was really happening in the world around these video connections of people who never had the opportunity to be connected before. So I'm just gonna share with you a short video um, that, that we created when I was at Skype when um, we decided to go about this strategy and we asked our 
users, our fans, our Skypers, what are those stories? And this one kind of came to the top and we put it together and I want to share it with you. And when this is done, I'll just do a quick wrap up and then we'll have a good amount of time for some Q&A for anybody who has questions. So here goes the video. I consider Paige like a long lost sister that I like never had that I should have had. The crazy thing is, me and Paige have been so close, but we actually have never met. Thank you. I consider Paige like a long lost sister that I like never had that I should have had. The crazy thing is, me and Paige have been so close, but we actually have never met. Oh, this was the first time that I held Sarah. My mom was pregnant with me and just found out that I had one arm at 20 weeks, I think. She wanted to find someone else that was experiencing the same thing. So she went on a website and found Teresa and Paige. When me and Sarah were born, our parents were like sending letters and pictures to each other and stuff, so they became close. And then we kind of lost touch because Teresa had two more kids. When I was eight, I needed someone there that could understand everything about me, and I was like, I want to find Paige. My mum got an email from her mum, and apparently they had been looking for us for three years. We started emailing first. I asked her one day if she had Skype. What time is it for you? I think they're like having When I first saw Paige, it was like I've seen a mirrored image of me. When I saw Sarah, it was kind of like, oh, this is how people see me. We'll talk about boys and life and compare things. She doesn't really worry about what other people think about her. She can walk around happily in a short sleeve top. Good one. She helped me a lot and gave me a lot of confidence. There weren't less challenges after I met her, it's just that I wasn't going through the challenges alone anymore. And I like move the brush or I move my finger. And so I move my finger. Yeah. I could tell Sarah things that I wouldn't be able to tell my friends. I trust her with my life. We have been so close for eight years thousands of miles away from each other. We definitely wouldn't be very close if it wasn't for Skype and how it's pulled us together. Some best friends come and go. I feel like Paige will always be my best friend no matter what. It's crazy that we've never met. We've always dreamed of it, but it's just never happened yet. And I can't believe it. I don't think it's really sunk in. I'm really nervous. No, it doesn't seem real. Five minutes and 34 seconds. <laughs> I can't do that. I'm sure we will always find time for each other because it's one of those friendships that you don't find twice. We're like two needles in a haystack that just found each other. So thanks for indulging there. The uh, what we. What we did there is said, if our vision is to bring people together when they're apart, and we meant that virtually, what would it actually mean if we did it physically? And kind of take the highest, most amazing technology, because when Skype first came to market, many of you will remember, it was like magic. Now today we're on videos all day long, but it was like magic. And how did we actually do a juxtaposition of the technology world and make that real physical human connection? So kind of in wrapping up with the five, at least things that I've learned in the course of my career in life is that it actually turns out to just be life. <laughs> the test of my presentation capabilities <laughs> with being interrupted with an emergency. <laughs> I'm so glad, honestly, well kidding aside, that it wasn't serious and it was, and we're all fine here in New York. Um, so I don't believe in work-life balance, which the reason that this kind of quote came up is not just early in my career, but I would say up until the time that I said this out loud, the first thing that most journalists would ask me, and I've 
in recent years, most years in the last 15 years, I've been in jobs that really required me to talk to journalists. And most of them, men or women, would start with, so Elisa, how do you do it? How do you balance? I know you have two kids and you have this job, whatever title it was at the time. And I hated that that was the first question that journalists asked me when I just did a product launch, or I just made an announcement, or I just had a customer, uh, a major customer win. And it made me crazy. And I finally realized that I got to say out loud, you know what? It's not about balance. It's about life. And so that's kind of my mantra and how I just became to own my own answer to that question where it used to make me really nervous and go, God, are they going to ask me that? I got to get through that before they talk to me about the stuff I'm really here to talk about. So I'm going to leave this slide up. It's just some of the things I'm not going to talk about, but you can read some of my favorite books, both for fun and for work. Um, a little bit about, about me, which is, of course, grounded in my UNH experience and um, things that I've tried over the last couple years that I think are a good shakeup in life. So I'm going to invite the dean to come back up with me here, see if she has any questions for me as um, we get going. And I believe we can also take questions on the webcast if you've yes. stuck with us through our um, emergency <laughs> drills here in New York and certainly in the room. So. Thanks, everybody, for being here, and I'll turn my attention to the dean. Well, thank you. So I'll kick off with one or two questions, and then hopefully I can open it up. To everybody else. Um, the first one is, I'm thinking of that slide you had with your, it was after the pyramid, so you had all the logos on the bottom, and yeah. it built up, and namely now at the top. So you've made a lot of pivots in your career. And can you talk a little bit about a pivot where you knew you wanted something and you figured out how you were going to get there versus the other kind of thing you also mentioned because of your network, opportunities came to you and then you had to decide where you're going to jump and take them. Yeah. So how does that work? How has so, that worked? Thank you. Pivots are really hard um, because that's the point where you're asking someone to take another bet on you because you're not actually focused on what you did in the past. You're focused on what you think you can do in the future. So it's kind of like getting your first job, right? Because when you get your first job, you don't have this history of experience that you can say, well, I've done that before and I'm the best candidate because of this, these results that I were, was able to deliver. You have to go with someone who's gonna bet with you on your future and your potential. And when you do a pivot, it's the exact same thing. And I think my biggest pivot, and I've had a, a few that I could talk about, but I'll, the one that comes to mind for me is I had had most of my career in enterprise business and selling to big enterprises. And Yahoo was going through a major transition and had a new CEO and their CMO slot was open. And I, I was in a meeting with um, one of the people who worked for me at the time at this enterprise company. And I had been there about five years and we had done a lot of great things together. And she said to me, Elise, I'm getting really nervous. Like, are you thinking of leaving anytime soon? And I said, <laughs> Jen, I'll tell you, the only way I'm leaving this company is if I get the CMO of Yahoo <laughs> and thought it was the funniest thing that I ever said. And because it didn't even seem like I could even be possibly considered for this job. And it was a major pivot for me because I had no consumer background, no consumer experience, but I wanted that job and I went for it. And it was a very long difficult process to get that job, you can imagine, very competitive. And I remember um, feeling like, when is this ever going to end? Because it was so stressful to be going through the process and not knowing what the end was. And by the way, that's when I took up kickboxing. It's like, okay, if I go to kickboxing every night, that is really hard and really aggressive. I'll forget all about the job thing. So I was at kickboxing for about a week, and I got a call from the recruiter who said, um, the CEO wants to, wants to see you tomorrow. Um, and I said, oh, to let me down easy? She could just tell me on the phone. He said, no, I, I think you should go in because you know, this is a relationship you might want to have in the future. I'm like, oh, that's good advice. So I dressed all in black to go to being <laughs> let down because I, I just expected to be let down. And, um, but I did wear purple lipstick, by the way. I, I felt branded and I wore purple lipstick for good luck. Yahoo purple. Um, and I got the job. And um, Carol will tell you to this day um, that I was not the most qualified candidate. 
And of course, she had a lot of fun telling me that for the three and a half years that I worked for her. Um, but I was not the most qualified candidate. And she bet on me because of my ideas, because of how I presented myself, because of the sheer passion I had for doing a great job. And I want more of us to do that, right? Bet on each other, open doors for each other. Um, I didn't talk much about this, but it's so important. If you look at that pyramid concept, the diversity of the people that you work with help grow you and grow others around you. And that's what I really have learned throughout my career is the value of that diversity and how important it is to bring not only into your life, but into your company. That's great. Thank you. So what was it about the Yahoo job that made you really work so hard and put well, yourself out there? The Yahoo job at the time was considered sort of a turnaround, although the company was massive scale with obviously hundreds of millions of people on Yahoo every single day. Um, but it had a, um, a monetization challenge. And so the new team with the new CEO was really responsible for making that happen. So do you have a similar example where you were just happily going along in your job and then some new opportunity actually presented itself to you? Um, well, I, happily going along in my job is throwing me. <laughs> okay. Where you were in your job. Were like incredibly intense and hard work and, um, you know, you always do it, I think, with the end in mind. But you know what I mean. It's sometimes the changes are you're in a pathway. I think you were alluding to this when you were talking earlier. And then all of a sudden this really kind of maybe out of left side, you know, interesting opportunity comes by and you're going, what, really? Yeah. Me? And then you take it. Yeah. I and that's so. the jungle gym, right? More yeah. than the, more than the latter. Yeah, you that's exactly any right. Of those? And I think, you know, for me, I think um, kind of the advice attached to that would be opportunities do come your way. If you're really focused, frankly, on getting your job done and doing it incredibly well. If you're focused on, oh, what's my next big opportunity? It's just not going to be as big or as good. If you're in the job, you're not thinking about your next job. You're just wanting to kick ass. Those opportunities come to you anyways because people can see that that's what you're doing. So I think my strategy for that would be an anti-strategy. Don't go out looking. Just get the job done. And it will come to you. So do we have questions from the audience or from the web? Yes. Well, first off, thank you. I'm Greg. I'm the president of the UNH alumni chapter. So thanks everyone for coming and thank you awesome. for, nice for, to for you. hosting. This is a great opportunity for us and I'm very passionate about seeing your success. Um, did you, you know, you mentioned the whole ladder concept, right? And, and I've been in the same company since I graduated and we talk about the ladder, right? And, it, and I find it funny too, because it's, you know, my wife pushes it. My wife is a young grad too, pushes on me, says, ah, you got to just keep going, focus on what you're doing and it'll happen. Like you just said, um, do you ever feel like at the beginning of your career, you were on a ladder? And then as you developed, do you feel that besides your skill set, obviously you have the skill set, do you think that passion is the one that kind of helps you get ahead faster? So I'll take the second question first, which is you can be really passionate and not have skills and that's not going to get you very far. Um, I think what the differentiator is, if you truly are authentically passionate about what you want to accomplish and you have the skills and the wherewithal to get there, that's going to differentiate you. It's actually kind of surprising the amount of people who don't do their homework. Like you probably see this in your job today, but it's just amazing to me. The people who do their homework really create a solid point of view and are passionate about it, are actually really differentiated. And what was the first question? Um, the whole ladder concept. Did you, at the beginning of your career, yeah. did you think that you were on a ladder or did you always never have the ladder concept? No, I definitely, I wanted a ladder. <laughs> you know, it was like, that's all I thought about. And it was so wrong. It was actually, I mean, some of your biggest learnings are when you find out how wrong you are. And this was one of my biggest learnings of, no, like, that's not what I want to do. And I really discovered this through being a manager. Because once you're not an individual contributor and you're responsible for other people, you really have to put those people first. And if you don't have it in you to want people to rise above you, beyond you, farther from you, then you're not going to be a good leader. And I just found early in my career that I actually loved that. 
And, um, you know, one of the people who um, works for me today, she's not here tonight. I tell her all the time, like, I cannot wait till you're a CEO. And, you know, come hire me as your consultant if I'm any good, right? Because you're fantastic. So helping people kind of achieve that and being a part of their pyramid is really what I think it's all about. Thank you. Other questions? Uh, we have one from the web. Perfect. Can, can you hear me? Am I? Perfect. Um, so we have a question. Thank you to the online audience for attending with us. Um, Lisa, what are the variables that you use to determine when it's time to pivot or transition or start the search for a new company or role? It looks like you did a lot, had a lot of opportunity and changed roles quite a few times in different companies. So when do you know it's the right time to make that kind of move? When the job is done, never start something you're not going to finish. And I can honestly tell you, I don't think there's a pivot or change in my career that I've made from one company to the other where I didn't make a commitment and complete that commitment. Sometimes it's a multi-year commitment. Um, the company I was telling you about before I went to Yahoo had a multi-year commitment, not in terms of an employee contract. I mean, what I was going to lead and help and be a part of the team that made happen. And we did you know, fulfill that promise. And I think that's really, really important also, not just for the pyramid concept, but for the strength in your relationships over time. Never leave a job unfinished. I would not ever want someone to say about me, you know what, she said she was gonna do that, something better came along and she left us in the lurch. Just to build on that for a second, so does that mean when you have finished that big task that you were hired to do, is that when you start picking up your head and looking around? I so, I mean, I think you can't really learn everything that you need to learn at one company with one group, with one team. Um, you grow and change and you're challenged by change. And so having new people around you, a new strategy, a new company, a new place you have to figure out, how do I fit in? How can I excel? Is actually really big part of, of growing. Um, what I definitely underestimated in change um, kind of mid-career was how important culture is. Where, you know, if you're a top performer and you get the job done and you've always been rewarded for that, you kind of have a way that you go about and you do that in any environment. And when you transition from company to company, culture is probably your biggest enabler of change. And I had one transition in my career where I wasn't thinking about that at all. I was just thinking about this job that was created that I now have that I wanted to deliver against my commitment. And I didn't kind of watch the culture match around me. And I was very, very lucky because about 90 days into that assignment, one of the executives who had hired me, I was literally just walking down the hall and he pulled me in a conference room and he said, at least I got to talk to you. I said, okay, what's up? He said, you walk too fast. And I said, what do you mean? He said, you are always in a rush. You are always walking fast. And you know what that tells people around you? Something's wrong. Let's talk about how you slow down to go fast. And it was such an awesome moment for me because I didn't know I was off track at this company. I thought I was doing what I was supposed to be doing. And when he told me that, it allowed me to step back, breathe, and realize I didn't have to get this job done inside six months. I had to actually get it done and bring people along the change curve with me. That was my biggest learning about culture and coming into a company and really looking at what, who's around you, what's around you, because behavior is super important. And if you're exhibiting behaviors that aren't in line with the cultural norms, then chances are you're not going to be very successful, whether you have good intentions or not. So I have a follow-up to that, but let's see if anybody else does. Any other questions? Craig. Thanks. So in this always-on world with uh, social media uh, coming at us from all directions, how important is it for uh, people to build their personal brand and, and have that out there? I'm going to give you two conflicting answers because I'm actually in conflict myself on this right now. And I would bet many of us are. So 
on the surface, it's incredibly important. Um, your social profile, how you represent yourself, um, what your profile says, um, your privacy settings, who sees your profile, who doesn't see your profile. And in work today, let's go back to the concept of work style and lifestyle. In work today, it's just true that people get through the recruiting process. If you have an open Facebook profile, your recruiters are gonna look at that. Even though it's not your work persona. They're gonna look at your LinkedIn profile, they're gonna see if you're on Instagram. People wanna know you're a full person. And so, you know, you have to be very mindful of what does that profile look like? So I think that's very real in today's society and we have to do that. And transparency and openness is really important. On the other hand, the reason I'm in conflict in it is, and I'll only speak for the young people in my household, which who are teenagers who are you know, headed out into this world, so much of what goes on social media actually isn't real, right? It's managing your persona. And I actually don't think that that's helpful. I don't think that that is helpful to kind of have that superficial layer about what you're doing and who you're with and all of that. So I think social media has gone pretty far in terms of invading our, the way that we live our life. Um, but I think the practical reality is the first answer, which is it's so important and you should be very mindful of social media. And I would say the same thing that um, um, used to be said before social media, which is don't say anything that you wouldn't want in the Wall Street Journal quoted to you. Don't do anything on social media that you don't want people to see. You can keep that private. I loved your comments around the philosophy of management, put your people before you. That's definitely not a given, so I commend you for that philosophy. I'm wondering how you practice that when your team grows to like 400 people as it is at Namely. So it's easy to do with one-on-one -on -one relationships. Yeah. It's harder to do when you move past that. I was wondering if you had talked about that. Yeah, sure. Um, if you have an operational problem in your, in, in, in a, in your company, Pretty likely, like 99% likely, you can track that back to the leader. Because everyone is a part of a community in the company and a team. And the number one people, the number one reason people leave jobs is because they don't have a good what they perceive as a good manager or a good leader. It is the number one reason. And so that personal relationship becomes critical. You have a great culture, great strategy, fantastic product. You might stay a little bit longer with a crappy manager, but you're not going to stay very long because life is too short. People, you can go work somewhere else. And that's a huge opportunity and challenge, right, from the employer and the employee side in today's market. But the way that I think you do it at scale is you have to have leaders that you trust are doing that. You have to hire leaders who reflect that value. Of course, you want diverse leaders, but you want leaders who reflect that value of it's about the team's growth and it's about giving individuals opportunities to be successful. If you have a mismatch of that on your leadership team, it's really tough and it's usually not going to last very long. It's a great question because it's a hard, hard problem in big organizations. Uh, I have a question. My name is Mark and I ask some weird questions sometimes, but... Um, oh, good. I was waiting for one. You're waiting for one. It's just kind of come from me. Um, my question is that you talk, you talk about fitting in and how it's important. I think that all the team members can fit in together into a, you know, a group together. And when you talk about the pyramid, which you started talking about, um, you show a picture of the one at the Louvre, okay, which to me doesn't fit in. I showed what, a picture what, of what? The pyramid at the Louvre. Oh, yes, okay. yes, yes. Why wouldn't you show the one at Gaza, which is the beginning of time in lieu of one that doesn't fit in at the Louvre? I don't know. Come to my next presentation and see if I take your advice. <laughs> you lived up to your promise with your question. That's for sure. Hi, uh, my name is Aditya. Um, I have a lot of questions, but first off, I want to thank you for having us this evening. And it's a pleasure to be in your company. Oh, thank you. Um, so I'm starting out my career. I graduated in May. Um, 
I sort of wanted to ask you, you know, there've been, there might be, when you started out, there might be, you might've faced challenges at the beginning of your career. Uh, sort of walk us through the mindset that you had when you, you know, you met your, you, you, you were doing what you loved. You put in the uh, uh, effort, but you didn't see, you know, results coming along. Uh, walk us to the mindset of how you tackle those challenges and still kept on going, thinking of the bigger picture in life. So I interviewed someone yesterday and I was trying to figure out if that person was a fit. Um, and this person said to me, I was asking her questions around um, her specific specialty, but also cultural fit. And she looked at me and she said, I just want you to know I'm a fighter. Let me tell you why I'm a fighter. And she had me right there. Because you know what I think is so important in your career? The people who take the hard problems are the people who get rewarded. And they're the teams that have the most fulfillment. Because it's the hard problems that actually, once you wind up solving, become high ROI. The easy stuff, you can kind of coast. And you can still be a, a good performer, a strong performer, but you're not actually using your best skills. So I guess my best advice on that is be a fighter. Go after the things that are hard and you will get noticed because nobody goes after the hard things. They're really special people. Uh, let's take a question from the web. What advice would you give women in technology to be successful in such a male dominated industry? Stay in it. <laughs> Don't yes. leave. Don't give up. Don't leave and band together. Women in technology tend to opt out faster than men in tech technology. And for all sorts of reasons, many of them so legitimate, but stay in it and help us make the path forward. And by the way, women in technology, we need men. The men have the history of the positions, the title, the power, and the money. And therefore, we want to partner with them. We want them to advocate for us. We want them to be our partners. We want to help them be successful. So it's actually not, for me, about women in technology. It's about women in, in technology for all of us. And women in technology, or technology is better with women in it. And as a matter of fact, tomorrow night, we have an event here around um, women in technology and gender bias and how do you not have gender bias in the workplace and what can we do to support each other? So um, I think my, my call to action is please stay in it and create partnerships for yourself so it's not so hard because it can feel very alone. It can feel incredibly challenging, but when you create partnerships with both women and men, it's just better. So let me ask just a quick follow-up for this because I was talking to a group of students about this exact same issue uh, yesterday. And so you, you said stay in it kind of no matter what. So my question to you is what's the grit or what do you have that has allowed you to stay in it? Because you've been in really challenging jobs and you've got a long career in technology. So what is it that you've been able to do? Well, first of all, I mean, I have a short pithy answer, which is I like to win. <laughs> So I'm not going to cut anything short. But that being said, that's kind of like I said, a short pithy answer that doesn't have a lot of substance to it. I think it's really, really important to do the things that you want to accomplish in life and not let others get in your way. So when I say stay in it, it's not stay in your company or stay doing the same thing. It's find a way to be in it in a way that can be personally successful for you. And everybody defines that differently. Um, but th that's, that's what I think. I mean, I think we have to be empowered to make those choices. Now we need and to, the lights are going off here in New yeah. York. I think <laughs> we're wrapping it up despite the, smile, the fire alarm. Well, where's the after party? <laughs> <laughs> we have an after party, but Alyssa, just on behalf of all of us here and all of us that are on the web, thank you so much for your energy, for your insights and for the road that you've paved. Very forward. To be here. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks everybody.